What's up guys and welcome back to another video. Today I'm going to be going over card management, card rotation, uh, and just like pro tips uh, regarding that and a little bit more um, stuff as well that kind of just goes on in the mind of a pro player as a match is going on because it's more than just placing your troops in the right location and being completely reactionary. Um, I don't think any top players are completely reactionary. There's a lot of uh, aggressive moves and there's a lot of thought going on about future rotations and even if it's not incredibly active thought it's something that becomes passive the more you play but you had to think about it when you first learned it and that may be a little bit confusing but I'll try to clear up what I mean um, oh and just saying as well I'm doing some pre-recorded videos because I'm gonna be out of town for a little bit so I'll, hopefully I get a uh, fill the gap but anyway the first, so these are some things that separate a casual player and a casual match from a competitive one. So I play completely different when I'm just casually playing a really early on match in a GC or just ladder where I'm not really paying attention. Um, from when I'm focused playing a competitive match and nothing else matters. Uh, if anyone has seen me in like Kings Cup or any live event or uh, Gamergy, I... I don't like when I'm streaming and stuff I'll smile and yeah but I, I have there's like a different mode and a lot of competitive players are like this to where when you're fully focused there's a lot of other things going on in your mind and uh, it, it, it's in some ways it's like a chess match you have to think about the advanced uh, parts of the game and I'll, I'll start listing off uh, what I'm talking about so number one you should try to every single match no matter what you're playing, you should try to identify their deck based on the two, first two or three cards they played and start planning based on that. So, um, if they pump early on, it's either like, in this meta, you can kind of identify it's either three Musk or like the P.E.K.K.A. Uh, pump deck. It's not 100% and you'll see as all of their cards are revealed, but you can start to expect things. Like for example, if your versus, if you think your versus three Musk, he, uh, three Musk kill especially, and you have poison, you might as well just use your poison on the pumps a lot of the times, or depending on what your minion horde defense is, you might want to uh, say poison, not use it on three musketeers, only uh, use it on the minion horde, and then Electro was on top of it to kill maybe. Um, so that's just kind of things you can have going on in your head. If it's versus uh, Pekka and you identify that, maybe if you're playing like your giant uh, minor deck, you don't play your giant. Even before he uses the P.E.K.K.A., you can realize that his deck, especially if it's like the bridge spam cards in addition to pump, um, it's a little bit different from the three months deck. You can identify that he has P.E.K.K.A. before you play a giant in the first place. So it, there's an, uh, an advantage to having like the mental prowess to realize these things as opposed to having it outright shown to you. Um, and then also another example would be Knight or Princess. Well, more so Princess, but you can generally tell from those two cards that it's either a Spellbait deck or a Hog deck. Um, and then you can start to maybe save your Hog defense. Don't play Night Witch at the back. Keep her in your hand, uh, for example. And those are just some of the mind games that go on or some of the things that you can um, acknowledge and get used to identifying before the match. It, it should never be a surprise. Um... Especially, well, more so in competitive, I guess in ladder there's more variances, so maybe they have like a really weird deck, but their deck shouldn't be a surprise halfway into the match. You should identify what their deck is like in the first 20 seconds a lot of the time. Um, going on to the second tip, uh, be adaptable. So, for example, if you're versus Spellbait, you don't log a Princess. But if you're versus Hog, which is Goblins as the only other Spellbait, then you can log the Princess. There's no correct answer to whether you can or can't do something in a certain situation. There's a lot of context that needs to be taken into consideration. So you... So it's not all about positive elixir trades, even though you obviously strive to have positive elixir trades. Um, sometimes it's better to take like a neutral trade or an... Not the best trade on defense if it means you are saving for a, uh, a future encounter or something. So like, like, like what I'm saying is sometimes you poison a princess instead of logging her because you still get some damage. It's negative one elixir trade, but now you save your log for defense and that princess won't be applying pressure to you. So she's off the field. Um, and, and that's just something that you have to identify based off their deck. Like the first tip I was saying uh, that Plays are different within different games. Once you identify their deck, you can more adequately decide 
whether something is the correct play or not. And this comes from experience uh, within certain matchups and also um, within just knowing the game well. And that's not something that you can immediately pick up, but uh, the example, like I'm saying, is you save log for Goblin Barrel. Uh, another one would be um, if you have poison and they play, I don't know, like a, a Skarmie or something and you're going on offense, um, there's instances to where if that poison is needed for, I'm, this isn't the best example, but if that poison is needed for defense, like if they have a minion horde and you have no other splash in your deck, uh, you don't want to use, even though poison gets rid of Skarmie, you, you want to save it. So there's just different situations to where the obvious play isn't the one you should make. There's, there's some like thought process that goes into saving cards for other things within their deck uh, and, and stuff like that. So the next thing that I'm kind of already starting to get into is identify their hard counters to your win condition and either punish or avoid them. So this example would be Night Witch at the back. Say I'm playing a hog deck and they play Night Witch at the back. So instead of playing my own card at the back, I instantly rush the opposite lane with Hog, um, and I get some damage, and maybe he plays Goblins. The thing about this is, while um, depending on whether I log or not, I may get more or less damage, the thing is, the reason I go this opposite lane, and the reason why playing a Hog at the bridge in the opposite lane is better against a Night Witch at the back than it is against an Ice Golem at the back, it's not because you're punishing the elixir, which is good, uh, which is more so applicable when they spend something that's four or five elixir plus. It's good because you are using a hog in the opposite lane of a hard counter to a hog. And a lot of times you get lucky, get a ton of damage off, and this also uh, screws up their future rotations. And I'll talk about this a little bit more um, as we get down the list. But you want to either punish like this and in this example a hard counter like the likelihood is if they're using something um that is a hard counter to hog they're gonna have to respond with something that isn't as good a counter so like a bandit for example or a goblin um and this sets you up for future plays because uh their rotation is now set to where they're always going to get night witch before the hog and especially if they're not intel intelligent enough to hold the night witch for future encounters, which is something you should do. If that happens to you, you should hold the Night Witch in the future and use her for a counter push as opposed to uh, starting her from the back. Because if you get defensive value from a troop that can turn offensive, uh, it always gives you so much more value in that situation than if you were to start it from the back. Which, it's not a bad starting play to start it from the back, but it's something that you have to realize and adjust. Or, if you don't adjust, you're likely going to lose because you're going to be taking a lot more damage than you would if you had the proper counter in hand. So holding cards, uh, once again, is a very important thing within the game once you have identified your opponent's deck. Um, and uh, the punishing in that example is also very important uh, because if they ever start something in the back, this is the same concept behind if someone starts to peck in the back and you're playing a giant uh, a giant minor deck, the rest of the game you didn't play giant. But now that his peck is out of hand, you can go opposite lane and you can go giant night witch at the bridge, pressure him, make him split his resources, and he'll be less likely to have a significant push as a result. All right, so and then fourth know that a certain rhythm evolves in a game this is kind of talking about uh their rotation being screwed up after they start a night witch in the back um cards become available after four separate card uses so you play a hog you have to play four more cards before you get back to that hog that's simple right this for instance allows you to predict with early spells based on their hand and this is where predictions come into uh into play with uh, uh, that previous example was he plays night witch in the back he uses goblins to defend so next time if he doesn't purposely hold his night witch when you play hog you know that after his night witch has been played um, not it depends but um typically after that night witch is played his next card and especially if you just straight up count which is what i do sometimes straight up count that they've used four cards or just get the rhythm and the feel down and i don't even necessarily um straight up count sometimes i do but it evolves and um, as you play more and as you actively think about these things while watching replays and in your games it becomes kind of a second nature to know what their hand is especially when it comes to hard counters that's the thing that you really should pay attention to also their spells um, but that's something that you pay attention to 
And once you identify that Night Witch is played at the back again, I play Hog, and then so their goblins get absolutely no damage. I pre-log, and based off their tendencies, uh, whether they like to play goblins in the middle or whether they like to play them directly on top, you can pre-log in the previous location and use their tendencies to your advantage. And also, you know that they almost have to play the goblins because they don't have a better counter in hand. Um, and this is another thing, if you are a competitive player, it's, it's a lot of this is mind games. Um, the pre-log works, but maybe even though goblins are a better counter to hog than bandit, the first time I played uh, goblins against a good player, I know he's going to try to predict. So the next time I use bandit to defend, even though it's not as good, because now he's going to use that log uh, in advance and he won't get value out of it because it hits abandoned instead. And then now that the log is out of hand, I can play my goblins and then I can counter push. So that's another thing that comes down to card rotation and just outsmarting your opponent uh, during a match. So next up, the fifth tip. The best time to go forward with heavy elixir investments is either when your opponent's card rotation is non-threatening or when that heavy elixir expenditure gets a lot of value and then pays for itself. So what this means, for example, is in this bridge spam meta, um, people like to immediately punish pumps. And I would advise against starting the game with pump because of that. So the game starts, someone pumps, I immediately spam uh, Night Witch, or Battle Ram, Night Witch, Bandit, uh, maybe a spell, and I take his tower and I kill his pump. Um, why did this happen? One, it was because I had a great hand, but um, you shouldn't count on your opponents having good or bad hands to uh, initiate your success or to result in you having, um, well, to get the best results, you shouldn't rely on chance, uh, pretty much. So I, I would never, I don't like starting pump because there's a decent chance that you're immediately going to get punished and... That's just not a chance I like to take during matches because I don't want to lose based on my opponent's starting hand. I want to lose based on my own decisions, my own faults, not what my opponent does. So, um, and then obviously if someone expends a big, uh, like a pump start the game or they start a tank at the back, that's why you push opposite lane and you rush because you know that they're down an elixir. But the best time to actually pump isn't at the start of the game, is actually this is shown in this replay. And look, 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 this is actually kind of perfect. Uh, I'm not surprised. I'm not sure Batman actually should have really hard rushed here. He only went um, bandit, but he should have gone like uh, Battle Ram Night Witch, and I think he's going that now. Yeah, I, he actually should. He had a lot more reluctance than he should have. Now he's going to be buying an elixir. But typically, you want to rush um, all out because of that expenditure. But the best time to play a tank or to play a pump is when you know your opponent can't punish it. And when is this? This is after they use their win condition. So, um, say someone has hog, um, instead of playing a pump and then letting them hog, or instead of letting, so, okay, so another example is if you're against a graveyard deck, and I think this is a better example. Um, you pump that graveyard, they poison. This is, and, and then they can punch that pump that gets them damage. This is bad. What you wanna do in the future is um, save that pump, let them do another graveyard push, adequately defend it, and then pump after. They have no answer. And if they do poison the pump after their graveyard, um, assuming they have it in hand, their poison is now out of rotation of their graveyard. So that's that's a two and one. You're getting you're not getting punished punished on the pump, and they either can't punish the pump, so you get an elixir lead, or you take their uh, secondary punishment to the pump out of rotation uh, from when they want it, and it, that depends on the matchup. Uh, to whether they actually need poison on offense all the time or whether they're cycling or they'll cycle back to it But that's just one example of to where pumping at a certain time. And this is the same thing um, Golem for example, you only want to play it in double elixir because you ha will have more elixir built up uh, You want to start it in the back on the side where you have taken more damage because that makes them push into you building up the push uh, It's the same kind of concept there um, to where you want to be punished as little as possible um, for playing such a, a large elixir expenditure, and the, uh, I mean it's it's not it's not just pump and pray. It's circumstantial. Um, I I only pump. I I, I like uh, I like to only pump when I know that my opponent can't punish it because they don't have a win condition in hand, for example. 
And that's that's a strategic play behind pumping. It's not just a dumb dead card. Uh, there's definitely times when you should and when you shouldn't pump. And uh, that's kind of just scratching the surface. But let's go ahead and move on to the next point. So, in cycle decks, realize that the nature of the deck allows certain cards to be used multiple times, offense or defense. And what I mean by this, for example, is say you're playing an expo deck that has fireball. Um, and, and you have just a really, really cheap deck. So say I'm playing against three must kill with minion horde. I can fireball a pump because I can play cards very quickly. And by the time he plays three muskies, I can play multiple cards. I can set up a defense on the one must side. And then when the two must cross, I'll have fireball back in hand already. And then I can fireball them and I'll get a positive four electric trade or whatever, depending on how you measure that because the fireball alone will kill it once they cross the bridge um and then this could also come in use with the minion horde you fireball a minion horde you quickly cycle to another fireball and then you fireball the three muskies so um this can also be used minor poison cycle people would poison multiple times once on offense and then once on defense uh, just know that if you're a cycle deck you can cycle to something twice same concept behind ladder if you're playing against someone that's playing hog cycle you might you really need to think about um using a oh and another way uh, to disrupt this cycle deck is okay so say i defend a hog with a uh, night witch if he cycles he will get his hog back in hand before i have my night witch two ways to alleviate this either identify a second counter or maybe maybe he doesn't pre-log and you have goblins and then you log to avoid all damage so you have secondary counters to where maybe you have to combo two cards together or you go on offense and the way to keep a cycle deck from cycling back to their win condition is by pressuring immediately. And then by going on offense, you are also cycling your cards at the same time. So I go with a graveyard push, I poison everything. I'm cycling back to my counter. He just logged a minion horde, but... <laughs> um, I'm cycling back to my counter by going on offense. Even if I don't necessarily get all the damage in the world, I'm cycling back to a, a card that allows me to defend his win condition because if he's being pressured, he can't immediately cycle and go back on offense again. Um, and then next tip, if someone plays a counter really late, it typically means that the counter will be late in the next offensive move as well. So I go with the hog push. Um, you, this is this is a little bit more applicable to cycle decks as well. But say someone, any target building targeting troop, like giant, hog, anything, um, if you have a decently cycling deck, if they play that defense late, like um, say my hog is already locked on, they log it backwards, they place a tombstone. While they did prevent damage this way, it means that they that log is going to come up one in rotation before the tombstone, and this means your hog that was played two cards prior. Um, or whatever like it was played like 10 seconds before is way farther ahead in your rotation than his defense is in his rotation so this means that if you uh notice this you can immediately start cycling and he won't have a defense in hand especially if he doesn't have a good secondary counter and this is something you should take note of is whether he has a good secondary counter um and it's good for you to try to rotate back to offense again uh, you can punish him because he made that misplay a lot of the times in this game if you misplay once If you don't know how to fix your rotation really well or if you don't go on offense and fix your rotation that way um, Your opponent can punish you uh, Because that what that first mistake has now screwed up your rotation for the entire game and Like I said going on offense can alleviate this if you're the person that screwed up the rotation and also, identifying secondary counters can uh, help you get through that. And then, if you absolutely know you can't defend without a certain card, uh, and you use it on offense, apply pressure. So this is kind of the same thing. Is So, okay, so this is a really good example. So if you're against the log bait, and you have to log on offense to get your push through, and you get a lot of damage, uh, something you can do is, instead of letting it get to 10 elixir you just start spamming stuff because uh you keep up the pressure this is more of a late game thing double elixir maybe his tower's really low you just start putting pressure forward 
and not giving him a single opportunity. This is the same concept behind not letting people save up enough elixir to rocket you to, in the game. You want to constantly apply pressure because if they are able to have that lax moment to where they know they can go on offense or they can set up a push, you don't have a counter in hand because you just use your logged on offense and he has goblin barrel. But if you apply the pressure um, and you throw troops at the bridge, as long as it's done in a smart manner, um, you don't give them an opportunity unless they want to lose their tower. And at the same time, you're cycling back to the to the log. Um, and another thing is, if you know that you can't defend... Uh, I think it's really important to know when you can't defend a push. Like if your counter is out of hand, you misplayed, or the time's dwindling down. There's a certain skill that you'll see a lot of uh, competitive players apply to where you just let the tower go. Especially if that push has no threat of three crowning. You just let that tower go and you all out bum rush the opposite side to trade with them. Especially if your deck is beat down or something that can take a second tower better. Um, because sometimes you just have to cut, you just have to cut loose the tower, um, and then light, maybe lightly defend and then take the other tower. And the way you know, this is just whether you can or can't defend. Like if their push is just too much, then you might want to let it go, play a ranged troop at the back to help clean that up. So you don't get three crowned and then use all that elixir they're spending in one lane, uh, use it in, on your advantage to know that they can't defend well because they don't have much elixir and to go the opposite lane, take a tower. Um, or do a lot of damage to a tower and set yourself up for a better situation than if you had defended Maybe your tower lives 100 HP doesn't really matter You don't but now you don't have any elixir to punish the opposite lane. He'll be prepared next time. So that's another uh, situation uh, And nine if play for elixir leads slash hold troops when it isn't necessary to expend them So I see this so much in uh, more casual matches people will over defend and they'll over commit Know when you're, I mean, this is a hard thing to, to know, I guess, but know when your push is done for. Don't, um, oh, so this is a great example. So a lot of the times you don't want to poison early on with the graveyard deck, even if it gives you, uh, okay, so, okay, so I set up early in the game, I go ice golem, graveyard, um, at the bridge, and he plays archers. If I can poison right away, great. Uh, my graveyard will do more damage. It'll take out the archers. He'll likely have to play something else, and I'll get poison value. But if that poison is at two elixir, and you have to wait on it, and you're just spamming it, um, and that graveyard dies, you are now poisoning two archers that would otherwise die to the tower. And this leaves yourself so vulnerable to an opportunity for your opponent to punish you because... He just defended effectively, got a positive elixir trade, and then you poison two archers on a tower. Um, and you were at zero elixir the instant the instant you expended this poison. Uh, this means that you, and you should know that you're desperately behind elixir if you do that. Um, and and that's, that's why you don't do it. Um, and that's why you restrain yourself and you save that poison and then you can precast it on the archers next time. Or you'll just save up enough elixir, start your push from the back, that type of thing. Um, and the second thing is people will over defend. So say, say I have three goblins running at my tower, um, maybe even their full health. Uh, should I log them? If I'm getting to 10 elixir and I can get some tower damage, yes. Um, if it's after a push and it can be goblins, it can be minions, and they're going to do like 100 damage, 200 damage, let it go. Just start a troop at the back and save that elixir. One or two elixir can mean a lot in terms of uh, being able to defend or being able to get a successful push. Don't log them just to avoid 100 damage. And especially know that you can take even like 500, 600, 700 damage if those troops are counter pushing and they're going to your full HP tower when your other tower is already at half HP for example. Um, because a lot of games end in 1-0s and there's no reason to care about the damage on your higher health tower. You should take the damage in order to acquire an elixir lead. Alright, and then finally, just kind of a way to wrap this up. Apply these tips to replays in battle. So not just, of course it's hard to think about this all during a match. And you can obviously just rewatch this whenever you want for the tips. Um, and, and think about them. But especially apply them in replays. So go into your replays, and this is just how you become a better player. This is something I did in the past, and I still do. Um, and go back, watch your replays, identify your mistakes, identify what your hand was, what your elixir was, 
what you could have done in that situation, what you should have known in that situation. Um, like I, I typically know whether I'm up or down in elixir, whether I over defended or over uh, committed. And these tips really help you to improve as a player because you're focusing on your mistakes and what you could have done mentally as opposed to blaming on, on outside circumstances or the, the, the matchup. Yes, you get mad matchups, but there's almost always something you can do better. And this is something I preached in the past. Um, and then, yes, try to think about all this uh, in your matches, but try not to think too hard as well because if you spend too much active thought, uh, thought that should be spent uh, be used on okay I need to play my Electro Wiz to counter the, the battle ram um, try not to think too hard because this is something that all comes with time um, and it comes in replay analysis a lot uh, this needs to all come second nature yes you think about it a little bit but you don't think about it too much to where you're not thinking about the actual game that's going on and I know this is kind of a lot of information and this isn't exactly everything in the mind in in the world when it comes to card rotation and elixir management, but it is a lot of the things that I commonly use and apply in my matches, and a lot of competitive players apply in their matches. And I hope these tips find you well. I hope you can use them to uh, improve your game, and I hope you guys have a nice uh, have a nice time trying to figure them out because it is stressful um, at first but it's a part of becoming a better player or if you don't necessarily have your sights set on becoming a pro player just using them to improve uh in in, incre in small increments uh not necessarily every chip in the world but just think oh um i he played his peck in the back i can punish the opposite side or just this is when i should pump this is when i shouldn't pump um and just realize this in your gameplays and once you start realizing your flaws you can use these tips to improve and uh, it's just something that comes with self-analysis, really. Um, and eventually, if you do it enough, it becomes second nature, and then uh, you become a good player, I guess. <laughs> I'm still working on it, nah. Anyway, thank you guys for watching, and I'll see you next time.